Uh, my name is Victor Cha. I'm a um, senior advisor and career chair here at CSIS, as well as a professor at Georgetown University. And on behalf of CSIS and Global Peace Foundation, we want to um, welcome you here this morning to our discussion on the United States, South Korea, and civil society cooperation in global humanitarian development. That's a long title <laughs> for an event, but, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're interested in this particular area is that international development um, really is an area that sort of epitomizes the history of the U.S. Uh, Korea relationship. As many of you know, um, Korea could not have become what it is today without um, development assistance, without the partnership uh, with USAID, and without uh, the Peace Corps. And today, Korea has turned from uh, being an international donor recipient to being a uh, donor provider. Um, it's uh, celebrating, I believe, this year its fifth year as a DAC country, uh, OECD DAC country. Uh, it's one of the few countries that is actually increasing its um, uh, development assistance budget these days. Um, and next to the uh, US Peace Corps, it has one of the largest Peace Corps operations in the world. Um, operating in all sorts of conflict areas related to health, um, infrastructure, building human capacity. So it's really an amazing story of partnership between the United States and Korea that we wanted to talk about today, and in particular, uh, how to move the partnership forward um, um, you know, with the signing of this MOU between uh, COICA and, uh, and the Peace Corps. So, um, so we're very excited about this. We're very happy to have all of you here today. We're happy to have Peter Redmond here from Peace Corps. Thank you so much for joining us and your team for joining us this morning. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, our co-partner our co in all of this work, uh, Mike Marshall, uh, from the Gold Peace Foundation to offer some initial remarks. So Mike. Thank you, Victor, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of the Global Peace Foundation. And, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank Victor, Ellen Kim, and all the CSIS team uh, for working together with us uh, to put this series of forums together. The series is taking a new look at aspects of Korean unification and Korea's changing place in the world. And this is the second of five joint forums, uh, so I hope you will follow the subsequent ones which will be uh, coming up in, in future months on Russia, China, and Japan, and their roles in the region. The Global Peace Foundation is a relatively young organization. Uh, we are an international nonprofit that is committed to exploring and promoting innovative values-based approaches to peace building and development. We're active in the US and Korea, as well as 13 other countries, mostly in the developing world across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, uh, promoting initiatives for community development uh, and the seeds of national transformation. Uh, our founder and chairman, uh, Dr. Hyunjin Preston Moon, uh, last year wrote and published a book uh, in Korea that is called The Korean Dream, A Vision for a United Korea. Uh, it's caused uh, quite a stir there, created a lot of interest. Uh, won a Publishers Award as Book of the Year from the Reader's News. The book covers a wide range of issues related to Korean unification and the broader Northeast Asia region. Uh, it examines the new regional economic and security opportunities in the light of the changing geopolitical context. Uh, of interest to today's topic, it highlights the role of civil society organizations in building bridges uh, among the nations and among the peoples of the region, and ultimately as a key component of any future unification process. Most of all, the book creates a new framework for thinking about Korean unification in terms of the Korean identity formed through the long span of Korean history and the principles and values that have informed that history. Those of you who are familiar with Korean cultural history uh, will know the concept of Hongik Ingan, for example. Such a framework has the potential to transcend the current divided politics of South Korea and the divided ideology of now North and South, 
the product of a mere 70 years of relatively recent history. The book and the Global Peace Foundation are committed uh, in the existing political and diplomatic stalemate uh, on the Korean Peninsula to exploring new approaches to uh, uh, unification and to the Northeast Asia region's future. That is the purpose of this series of forums. Today, uh, we will look at the role of humanitarian aid and civil society organizations in the development of the region as well as globally. Koika, of course, does not deal directly with North Korea or unification issues. Nevertheless, Korea's growing global role as a donor nation and its recognition of the importance of humanitarian aid is an important part of the new context being shaped in the Northeast Asia region that will ultimately provide the framework in which unification can occur. I look forward to hearing uh, the uh, remarks of the president of COICA, uh, Dr. Kim Young mok uh, and to an informative discussion to follow. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mike. Um, and now let me uh, introduce our featured speaker for this, this morning, Mr. Kim Yong Mok, who, as Mike said, is currently president of the Korea International Cooperation Agency, otherwise known as COICA, K-O-I-C-A. Um, as Korean overseas develop, uh, official development assistance grows, as well as the expectations of the international community, COICA is working hard to join in the mainstream of international development efforts. Uh, Ambassador Kim, in his role as president, promotes the concept of inclusive partnership, which is also emphasized in the MDGs, the post-2015 development agenda, and the Pusan partnership. Ambassador Kim is expanding the role of COICA as a platform for diverse public, private players, as well as stakeholders. Um, as many of you here in, from Washington and in, in New York know, he was a career diplomat for 35 years and served posts in Africa, the United Nations, Iran, and the United States. Having specialized in ROK-US bilateral relations and global issues throughout his career, Ambassador Kim has participated widely in the policy making and execution of security and economic agendas. He has also participated in a number of negotiations with North Korea, along with US and multilateral delegations on North Korea's nuclear program. He assumed a leading role uh, within the Korea Peninsula Energy Development Organization, otherwise known as KEDO, as Deputy Executive Director for both policy and the nuclear power plant project. During his career, Ambassador Kim has worked intensively with the private sector, corporation, media, NGOs on trade, economic development, and culture. Um, so it's, it's our distinct pleasure this morning to welcome President Kim for his remarks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so honored and pleased to be with you this morning. This may be the first time that Korea introduced what it's doing for global development in Washington. Uh, Washington is a little, little bit remote capital from our point of view because we're working mostly in developing countries. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for the excellent arrangement and the hospitality and your attention, interest, and nice arrangement for us to get together. Uh, maybe uh, I must read the text because my preparation was a little bit uh, comprehensive long and, and maybe not really exciting, but uh, kind of a, a lecture, so <laughs> please forgive me. First, I must uh, talk a little bit about the incident which we had uh, last week in Korea, uh, which surprised everyone, and sh we were shocked when Ambassador Lippert was attacked by a, a uh, from my point of view, schizophrenic person with a twisted and skewed ideology, which he believed in for too long time, which is right, rightly, 
from my point of view, uh, inconsistent with uh, what we believe as a destiny of Korea. He believes in some other fanatic ideology that we should reject, but he reversed, believed in that, and then he expressed his anger through uh, an attack. And I, I really hope that uh, Ambassador Lippert, he was out of the hospital maybe yesterday, but he should recover very soon. Uh, from my point of view, he is an icon of courage, which the United States is uh, showing to the world. And he was a very nice, friendly, and he tried to be in the middle of Korean people. Even though I didn't meet him yet, but through his Facebook, I became his friend. <laughs> I was impressed how much he tried to be, you know, reach out to ordinary Korean people. He was so loved. That's why he's being uploaded and he's getting so much support, sympathy from the Korean people. I think the alliance between US and Korea is strong enough and bondage is deep so that anyone can really reverse this from this kind of vicious sect. So anyway, I'm glad that we are here and Ambassador Lippert is okay. Uh, as Victor and then uh, uh, Mr. Marshall uh, introduced us and then hoped how Koika would play in the global and regional context. But I would like to minimize my scope at this, at least at this public session. I would like to introduce what we are doing mostly and how Korea has been developing from a poorest country in the world to a donor country this time. I, I think uh, we can share with you first the dynamic development experience of South Korea. I use the word dynamic since Korea is one of the few countries in the world to turn herself from least developed country to an official member of donor country of OECD DAC member. I would like first to touch how Korea, a war-stricken, underdeveloped, overcome the abject poverty utilizing development assistance from the world, especially from the United States, and how Korea and U.S. work together in facing global changes in development assistance. After the end of 36 years colonial rule of Japan, as you know very well, the Korea uh, Korean government was established in 1948. But unfortunately, the tragic, fratricidal Korean War broken out in just three years later, destroying the entire society. The damage of war was severe. The agriculture production was reduced by 27%, while the annual GDP was cut by 14%. More than 5 million people were killed, injured, or missed. Per capita GDP of Korea in 1953 was only around $70, approximately the same as that of Ghana. The life expectancy in 1960 was only 52 years, while the infant mortality rate was as high as 7%. With a strong commitment in development from the top and appropriate national development planning in the 1960s to 1970s, Korea was able to achieve remarkable economic and social development in a relatively short period of time, particularly the pro proper mixture of state planning and strong drive for industrialization resulted in drastic export increase and GDP growth. In parallel, the Korean government launched a rural community development program called Semal Undong, New Village Movement in English, at the beginning of the 1970s, reducing urban-rural development gap and revenue gap, and expediting equitable growth between the two areas. Villages in Korea, from my own experience, until the beginning of the 1970s, 
had no other stories than extreme poverty, hunger, and disease. When I was young, we were provided with uh, anti-parasite at school because most of Koreans at the time carried some kind of round forms in their intestine due to human manured agriculture. And it is well known, some of you may have uh, the chance to see a um, Korean movie recently played in the US. Uh, what was the name? Uh, Uncle something? Uh, showing the story of... Uh, Ouch, my father. <coughs> Ouch, my father. That is a story from the withdrawal from Hungnam after Cho Shinyu battle, then US uh, Marines and Navy could uh, uh, miraculously um, send hundreds of uh, thousand Korean people in the north to Busan and in southern area of Korea. That is a story how this family survived and then become very um, happy and decent family in Korea. Anyway, um, Korean people were sent to Germany for dangerous mining jobs. That picture showed one of the story. And to Middle East for harsh construction work. To simply earn money for living and to earn foreign currency for the government. And a lot of young girls had to go to factories to make a living for themselves and their families and had to work under hardship and sometimes with discrimination. The strong devotion and efforts of the Korean people for development were also backed by foreign assistance, as Victor mentioned. From 1942, officially to 1995, for five decades, Korea had received more than 12 billion USD worth of aid from the world. 44% of which from the United States. Your assistance to Korea play a really pivotal role in Korea's post-war recovery and economic reconstruction. USAID, maybe at the time, the name I remember was uh, USUM rather than USAID in Korea, played a key role in development of Korea. It provides bulk of financial resources to build infrastructure, while at the same time strengthened capacity of Korea and help introduce regulatory institutions. USOM provide much needed food for people and capital asset. And over 3,000 Korean professionals in diverse areas such as medical science, we have had uh, uh, many, many uh, bright and elite uh, medical doctors in the United States, thanks to this program. And many descendants are from, Korean Americans are from that early um, intellectual medical doctors. And provide them with intense training in the US passport. USAID also provided support and active in international institutional development organization that are playing crucial roles in Korea such as KDI, KIST, and Hospital of National University, to name a few. The role of the U.S. Peace Corps was also critical for the capacity building of Korea. From 1966 to 1981, more than 2,000 U.S. Peace Corps volunteers were sent to work with the Korean people in rural and community development activities. Also, they conducted various programs in English education, public health hygiene campaign. The Peace Corps were friends, teachers, and diplomats that acted as bridges in building unswerving ties between Korea and the United States. The former U.S. Ambassador, for example, to Korea, Ms. Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, was a good example to be recognized. Thank you so much for your coming today, friends of Korea. Uh, we have here 
uh, alumni of uh, USP school to Korea. Uh, the name of this alumni is Friends of Korea in the US. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the concerted efforts of Korean people as well as assistance from outside, Korea has recorded unprecedented economic and social advancement. According to IMF, Korea's GDP per capita is projected to exceed 30,000 US dollars this year, which will be an astounding sum, 404 increase compared to that of 1953. Uh, after Korea uh, joined OECDA, Korea quickly hosted a one of important forum for development. The fourth high-level forum on aid effectiveness in Busan in 2011, which produced the Busan Global Partnership Principle. Busan Principle became one of the key standards on development effectiveness in post-2015 agenda setting. Korea's total commitment to ODA 2015 is only about 2.2 billion in USD. Even though the ratio of, to GNI is still well below from what UN has recommended, the ratio of growth in volume is the highest among donor countries. For us, COICA is conducting uh, various integrated development projects and technical cooperation programs in over 120 countries. COICA also invites around 5,000 civil servants and young professionals in developing countries annually and provides training programs and capacity building opportunities for them. In addition, COICA runs overseas volunteer program and selects around 2,500 volunteers and experts and 2,000 short-term volunteers dispatching finally more than 4,500 volunteers annually. In addition, COICA has expanded knowledge sharing service on development issues through seminars, workshops, and training and forums in close partnership with the main international organizations and research institutions like UNDP, OECD, UNICEF, Chatham House, uh, whatever uh, institutions who are well known and have a reputable capacity in the world. Now, I, I think our uh, partner, Global Peace Foundation, would be one of these partners. And uh, yesterday, I had pleasure to meet with uh, uh, Janet uh, Froster of uh, Special Olympics, which, of which headquarters is in Washington. I was lucky to make a first ever partnership with this organization to help intellectually disabled people in the world. As a result, many developing nations consider Korea. It's not uh, a just a made story, it's true, because I meet so many people around the world. They all consider Korea as an exemplar model for economic development and social development, are trying to benchmark Korea's development experiences. For example, Semar Undong, which I mentioned, we, we studied in 1970s, is one case. Over 40 countries are asking for us to help them to introduce, implement similar Semar Undong in their country's own development. We are working with the uh, WFP, we are working with the uh, UNDP, also we are looking for some type of uh, broader uh, technical and knowledge sharing with the World Bank. There is also growing needs for us to, for us to assist technology development, human capacity development, particularly in the ICT area for all those countries. COICA also tries to make its assistance more effective by working together with diverse partners uh, the civil society in Korea now actively engaged in as many as 103 countries with more than 1,400 projects standing around the globe, given the figure as of 2013. NGOs in Korea <coughs> started as one who had to 
help uh, people injured and orphans and families lost. Uh, this was the start of a civil organization in Korea. Now, Korean civil society is engaged in more than 103 countries. They are raising 3.4 billion US dollar uh, as of yes, uh, last year. And they are uh, reaching out not only to south countries in the Southeast Asia, they are going to remote such remote countries as Burkina Faso. Do you know where Burkina Faso is? Malawi, Chad, those very fragile and, and vulnerable countries to help. I'm proud of them. Our budget to support these activities boosted almost 100 times compared to that of 1995. We are currently working with about 130 partners in the civil society and have committed around 5 million US dollars to fund projects of only this civil society without accounting without counting our program with uh, corporates and other sectors. We don't only fund from our point of view. We think it wise and needed. Try to leverage the funding and resources from other partners, not only domestic, but also worldwide. COICA is very keen to seek for innovative partnership with prestigious global NGOs and corporates and philanthropic foundations and international organizations that will bring far-reaching impact and value for investment we commonly make. Now I would like to touch what we are doing with the United States. On a broader perspective of alliance, Korea has, enjoyed, uh, Korea has joined in the U.S. effort on the global scale to secure peace and reconstruct war Street nations such as Afghanistan and Iraq, as you know very well. Korean government has supported these countries with cash and projects. The Korean government provided a grant of 260 million USD from 2003 to 2007 for the reconstruction of Iraq as pledged at the Madrid Donor Conference in 2003. Korea started to contribute another 200 million USD from 2008 to 2011. In addition, Korean government provide grant aid of 200 million USD to Afghanistan to promote sustainable economic growth and peace building. Also in the ISAF, ISAF International Security Assistance Force, Meeting in 2011, Korea is contributing grant aid of USD 500 million to Afghanistan for five years. Uh, I think we have allocated 300 million for capacity building of military and police for security, and 200 million for economic and social development. In these countries, with all risk of security, Members and staff and employees COIC has carried out such projects as hospitals, skill job training center, and schools. Uh, for example, in Bagram Air Base, we are still running uh, one hospital and one uh, job training center uh, where there is no one else among PRT members than Korea. These programs are highly appreciated by local residents and uh, U.S. commanders as well. I, I was there myself, and then uh, I was, uh, I had the opportunity to hear the old compliments from U.S. commanders and soldiers. I was so glad when U.S. Uh, servicemen, medical doctors, worked with our doctors in the hospital. They volunteered to help the operation of the hospital. They, they loved very much the hospital, but I think this hospital must be moved or remain is, is a very, very difficult question for us. Anyway, uh, as declared by President Park Geun-hye in her speech when he was here two years ago at the U.S. Congress, COICA and U.S. agencies, namely USAID and Peace Corps, 
have worked together to design and implement real programs, not only MOU, but joint programs in several uh, countries. You say that COICA working together on global health challenge program with COICA's modest financial contribution, which is for improving dramatically maternal health in Ghana and Ethiopia. Green growth pilot project in Vietnam in, is one, another case for cooperation. We are uh, going to, uh, on the other hand, formulate wider and broad partnership with both uh, countries' famous corporates like Samsung Electronics and Walmart in, with the U USAID. We are trying to form in broader public-private partnership with both countries. We are also very much interested in, in, in joining in the Obama's, President Obama's initiative called Power Africa because it is daunting task and then uh, we need a lot of uh, financial resources and uh, technical contribution and purpose building of Africa so that these projects can be realized. For the PISCO, we are proud that alumni of US PISCO volunteers are still very active with bondage and honor. The Peace Corps alumni, such as Nancy Kelly and other members of Friends Korea, are the ones who have encouraged us to form joint programs with Peace Corps. Um, Corey is here. He was the one who, uh, were, who were working very hard in the middle to link these two organizations. I thank you so much for this. The joint activists have also been realized in various countries since the MOU signed between COIC and PISCO. We have introduced capable human resources to each other, such as safety trainers in Jordan, Colombia, and Tanzania. PISCO volunteers have been invited to evaluation works of COICA projects in Nepal, Senegal, and Indonesia. Particularly, I'm so excited to see PISCO volunteers and experts to join in COICA's project site, such as healthcare center and job training school. We are talking about exchanging programs in El Salvador, Paraguay this year. Furthermore, we are going to share the best practice for the cooperation in this by participating in Peace Corps workshop, which will be held here in Washington, D.C. on the coming 30th March, very quickly, uh, maybe in two weeks' time. Still, we have plenty of areas where Peace Corps and COICA can work together, forming a youth alliance, learning and helping each other in Asia, maybe with the support of a Global Peace Foundation, and elsewhere is an important task we'll be able to promote. We believe such programs, if it really activated, would lay a solid ground for long-term long-lasting peace and prosperity and harmony and democracy in the region, particularly in North and South East Asia. There are many other um, subjects. I think you are already tired to listening to me. <laughs> Give me a few more minutes to finish. <laughs> Korea is also working very hard with other donor partners in development actors to address complex emergent and crucial challenges of security and peace and development and try to correspond together to new global commitments. There are so many challenges. Uh, you know, ISIS and uh, terror and uh, people are scared to do any economic activities. There are a lot of refugees in Jordan and Turkey for Syria, Italy is complaining with the instant immigrants from North African countries. There are so many problems we, we are now. Now we are entering into new era of uh, development, which we call it post-2015. This year is the last year to set up all the goals and make an agreement on how to make these goals possible uh, from how to find the money. What, what kind of policy you must take and how we coordinate among ourselves. This, is, this year 
is really key for the next decade. As you are all were aware, one of the uh, biggest problem and task for us is how to agree on controlling climate change. Climate change is a, uh, one of the biggest agenda for this year. And not only the climate change, as I mentioned, the conflicts and civil wars are creating serious humanitarian problems in the world. I think we are now in a worse situation than previous decade in terms of humanitarian situation. Worldwide humanitarian situation rapidly deteriorated and damages of climate change become ever overwhelming imminent than anyone anticipated. Not a single nation is immune from such global changes. To make the situation worse, all the problems and, and the exposure is with more vulnerable countries in the developing world than advanced countries. You know, on a broad note, uh, we are surprised by the demonstration, uh, violence, terror, and kidnapping, human trafficking in many countries. We, I think there is no uh, single day that without listening or hearing this kind of bad news around the world. I think the situation in Middle East, North and Central Africa, and West Asia, have been deteriorated and improved. <clears throat> millions of people, tens of maybe tens of millions of people, especially in developing countries and least developed countries, suffer from all sorts of high and low profile humanitarian crises, such as military conflicts, civil wars, environmental disasters, natural disasters, pandemic or epidemic disease and human rights abuse and violence uh, relations every day. According to the Global Humanitarian Assistance Report 2014, the num number of internally displaced people reached an unprecedented figure of 33.3 million, while the number of refugees rose to 16.7 million people. The global spending on humanitarian relief soared as diseases, disasters, deteriorates hundreds of millions of lives in developing countries. More recently, you, as we, you are uh, very aware, and then uh, now the situation uh, is being controlled, fortunately. Ebola destroyed the lives of so many people and economic activities in the West Africa. The Korean government also took part in the global efforts to fight against these tragic challenges. For example, for Ebola response, Korea is among seven countries operating national level <coughs> medical unit in Sierra Leone. There are so many who need our hands in and around the conflict zones. Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, Sudan, South Sudan, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Central Africa, Mali, Chad, and there are many more. Growing, another uh, challenge we, we face is growing inequality. Inequality has arisen within most developed and developing countries alike, making social stability and sustainable growth much more difficult than in the previous decades. Even though we have achieved many things in MDGs and then people are living under extreme poverty has been halved, but inequality has been dramatically risen in almost every country. For in a re with regard to climate change damage, climate change is very complex, to hard to deal with, and then uh, interests of countries are different and it's very hard to get a consensus the negotiations that took so long years that this may be the last chance for governments to get along. But the damage is very clear. 
almost 400,000 people per year is vanishing from the climate change, costing the world more than 1.2 trillion USD, wiping 60% of uh, 1.6% annually from the global GDP. Among many others, the climate change is creating also water and food security. Some countries in Central Asia are even facing a conflict with other nations because of water scarcity. While, for example, according to UNICEF and WHO, almost 800 million people lack access to safe drinking water worldwide. It is, it is I think, critical to note that there are notable predictions that predictions or warning that some regions are at risk of a potential military conflict over food and water in, 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 in the decade. Under this circumstance, world community, particularly OECD members, are trying to secure financial resources, noting their limit. Countries in the South, on the, on the other hand, are calling for expanded official assistance from the OECD countries, including Korea, It is growing concern that the resources and financing for development is not matching with the demand. There is, a, by estimation of experts, there is a one trillion gap per year in matching the demand, which is caused by climate change, natural disaster, and humanitarian crisis. How to make this fund possible is one, as I told you, one of the biggest concerns for us. With facing challenges of this scale, we need to effectively pull public and private resources together and try to mitigate risk in financing for the global development. For its part, COICA will continue to make effort to become an extensive platform. This is what we have built in Vietnam as a hospital. Extensive platform for as, as many programs as possible. Knowledge sharing, innovative ideas, and noble contribution from private sector we, we anticipate. We'll strengthen our partnership and expand our networks with various private partners partners in and outside of Korea, which I believe uh, one of them would be Global Peace Foundation. In fact, the US and Peace Corps are most important partners among others. COICA is also expanding partnership with other friendly organizations like DFID Britain, AFD France, JICA Japan, and those of EU. And Turkey, Mexico are extremely important partners for Korea because these are MICTA members. And Thailand and Brazil, there are many others. I believe cooperation with China will be one good part of our effort to form an extended partnership network that will contribute to peace and security also in Northeast Asia and reconciliation. Now, Korea and the U.S. together should continue on exhibiting leadership in the international donor community. I hope Korea and the U.S. continues to develop its alliance, not only in traditional domain of security and economy, but also in overcoming those global challenges and promoting decency of human lives. Now I'm finishing, so uh, don't be too much bored. <laughs> U.S.-Korea, we share a clear-cut common interest. Helping countries in transition or in transformation to succeed and finally achieve, let them achieve democracy and prosperity. I hope personally North Korea will look to these cases. At any rate, the world community is being called upon to form a inclusive partnership to enlarge base of our resources, financial, human, and technology. 
and value. I think from this partnership, we can really create wider impact and social values for not only our own citizens, but for the sake of a world peace and prosperity. Uh, now I'm finishing. I really thank you for listening to me. Uh, this is a picture taken by my staff when I visited one remote village in Ethiopia, where they were fascinated and thrilled by our help and my visit. Almost 2,000 villagers came out and chanting and dancing around me. So I could do, I had to do something for them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think uh, helping others and then getting this kind of uh, excitement is one part of our uh, pleasure and, and feel and be happy from the soul. I think helping others as uh, uh, values as it, as it has. Not with the reasoning, but uh, you know, just uh, as a human being, we are happy to help each other. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. They are not giving me a break. <laughs> Please, you sit there. Excuse me. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Ambassador Kim, for a, a comprehensive um, statement of all that you and Koika and the ROK and the U.S. Peace Corps USA idea are doing. Um, we'd like to use the time that we have left to have a little bit of a discussion um, and, um, and begin by first having uh, two of our friends and experts here at CSIS offer some comments, some reactions to, um, to what you've said so far. Let me briefly introduce them. Um, uh, uh, to the immediate left of Ambassador Kim is John Browse. Uh, John is the director of the World Food Program's Washington Liaison Office. Uh, he came to WFP following a 22-year career with uh, USAID, where he most recently served as Deputy Assistant Administrator in the, Bureau of, uh, in the Bureau for Management. Previously, he served as Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance. Um, and I worked with John uh, when he was on the NSC. He was the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Relief, Stabilization, and Development at the White House in 2008. Uh, prior to his time uh, in the NSC, he served as director of the Office of Program Policy and Management at USAID and served as a senior policy advisor to USAID Administrator Andrew Natsios. Um, uh, and then um, to John's left is uh, David Caprera. David is a non-resident fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. He also serves as director for the Global Peace Service Alliance. He formerly directed faith-based and community initiatives at the Corporation for National and Community Service here in Washington, D.C., and volunteers in service to America, otherwise known as VISTA, promoting mentoring programs, asset development, homeland security, and other initiatives to strengthen uh, children and families throughout the country. David conceived and co-directed the International Roundtable on Volunteering and Service with the Points of Light Foundation, USAID, and Corporation for National and Community Service. In 2006, he co-directed the International Conference on Faith and Service with former USA Freedom Corps Director John Bridgeland and the National Conference on Citizenship. Um, uh, prior to that, David served as Deputy Assistant Secretary and Director in the Office of Resident Initiatives under Secretary Jack Kemp at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, he also served as Director of the Virginia Governor's Commission on Citizen Empowerment and as Director of the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, so uh, first I would like to go to uh, both John and David to offer some initial remarks and then I think we'll try to open it up for, uh, for a discussion with the time that we have left. So um, John, would you like to go sure. first? Sure. Thanks. Thanks. 
Um, thanks, Victor, to you and CSIS for hosting this, as well as the Global Peace Foundation. I have to say, for me, it's, a, it's an amazing pleasure to be here listening to President Kim's comments on Korea's remarkable evolution, if you will, from a, a, a very needy recipient country to, to one that is a donor. Um, to bring it a little bit to WFP, the whole transition, this whole evolution that, the, uh, that South Korea has gone through, WFP's been along with them the whole time. Our history is now 51 years working with uh, South Korea on not just their uh, progress towards becoming a developing, uh, developed country, but now working with them as a donor country uh, in a way that um, I think is just remarkable. And it's, it's, it's good. Uh, the ambassador, president, made a comment that the, uh, their ODA levels aren't quite maybe where the world thinks they should be. But to me, uh, the ROK is a perfect example of what we want to see in all countries as they move along the development continuum. There has been steady, deliberate progress um, by the ROK to continue to grow their investment in the international community. Um, it started for us after 20 years of being uh, a help to them in, in their development from 64 to 84. Immediately after that point, they became a donor. It was modest, but it was deliberate, and it has grown every year. We are now partners with them working in Africa using the same New Village move movement that was used in South Korea to help develop the, the rural communities. We're now using together with them in Africa and in other countries, in Nepal, to help bring those communities along as well. Uh, so to me, it's, it's just uh, exactly what we look for, the kind of investments. And if I can just, I don't want to take too much time because I know we have a, a lot of questions that people will probably want to ask, but South Korea brings its unique development experience to the table, which many developing countries want to see. They don't just want the donor community delivering demands and requirements. South Korea brings an understanding that the other countries recognize. They say, we can do it too. South Korea did it, we can do it too. That's critically important. And South Korea, as the president says, brings a strong civil society to the table that's out there doing a huge amount. It's not just attention on North Korea, it's attention on the world. Um, and if I can, one personal anecdote. In 2007, I took part in the OCHA Donors Support Group meeting that was held in Seoul. Now this is, if you know OCHA, that's the Office of the Coordinator for Humanitarian Affairs, um, headquartered in New York. And the South Korean government decided to host the OCHA Donors Support Group, even though they had just joined the year before. They did a fantastic job. Um, but what's interesting is, about six years later, the deputy emergency response coordinator and assistant secretary general of OCHA is a South Korean woman. So South Korea is not just investing money, not just their ideas, but they're, in, they're committed to engage fully in the international development system to do what they can to make the world move forward in a positive way. And WFP is extremely proud to be part of um, their work to support them in their effort. And um, I'll just end by saying we just signed on February 11th our partnership agreement with the government of South Korea. And again, we are thrilled to be partners with them. So thanks. Great. Thanks, Thank John. You. David. Thank you so uh, thanks, Victor. And congratulations, uh, Ambassador President Kim, for a remarkable presentation of the Korean miracle on the Han and how Koika has come to the fore as a real leader uh, in global development. I wanted to underscore the role of civil society can play in multi-stakeholder alliances, giving further substance to the positive role Korea is playing in the field of international service. Last October at the United Nations for Asia in Bangkok, Global Peace Foundation, UNESCO, SCAP uh, teamed up with young leaders and NGOs from 40 nations and launched the Asia Pacific Peace and Service Development Alliance, I might add, facilitated by Peace Corps volunteers alongside Asian volunteers. Uh, later this month, that alliance will convene in Kathmandu, Nepal, 
uh, highlighting some models on the ground. Uh, President Kim talked about water. Uh, that certainly is one of them that Nepal is working hard on. And in June, in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, uh, there will be a Northeast Asia convening as well. Uh, after the Bangkok convening, Quicken Peace Corps came on stage uh, literally uh, bilaterally, but also multilaterally, which is very encouraging to launch uh, what's been affectionately called a global Peace Corps approach. Uh, this is a dream that in Asia, uh, ASEAN former Secretary General, Søren Pitsuan, while he headed ASEAN, actually proposed that after the Myanmar cyclones. Uh, it also furthers the Korean dream vision. We heard the ethos of service to the world articulated in Dr. Moon Hunjin's book shared by Mike Marshall, uh, as well as the original charge of Peace Corps itself that John F. Kennedy had to wage peace in the world through global service. Uh, this Asia Peace Corps ideal then took shape with the UN and these partners that included ASEAN entities, FK Norway sponsorship, Singapore, Australia, and many others. Uh, propelling the vision behind it all was really 400 young leaders from Manila to Jakarta, to Pakistan, Korea, China, that came together there. And I think their power uh, really helps propel all this. The Asia Alliance was launched uh, to take action on the post-2015 development agenda that's emerging, including clean water, all lights villages, youth entrepreneurship, health, uh, and other interventions. And there's also a peace and development nexus uh, emerging that I think is very important shaping this 2015 post agenda. Furthermore, a university research network was born. I want to uh, acknowledge my senior fellow colleague at Brookings Lex Riafal in the University of Philippines and others that were there in Bangkok and forged a scholarly network to assess outcomes. And I think we need more rigor in looking at that uh, in the post-2015 agenda. Uh, last week, Malaysia's uh, Minister of Youth was here in Washington, met with us, uh, and shared President Naj Prime Minister Najib's charge for them to form their own Peace Corps. He met Kerry Hessler and the team at Peace Corps as well. Uh, under Malaysia's current chairmanship, ASEAN is incorporating this whole alliance, Asia-Pacific alliance strategy into the, the wellspring of ASEAN's 10 nations uh, project on regional integration this year, which is significant. Uh, in Africa, similarly, the 19-nation Comesa bloc is doing the same, and GPF will co-convene with the East Africa community in Tanzania on this issue in June. Uh, along with the whole challenge of, of identity-based conflict in the region. Uh, prior service convening, so like the one in Bangkok, we're convening at UN headquarters in Africa, launching an Africa Peace Service Alliance or Corps. Again, Peace Corps volunteers were there, uh, facilitating alongside African volunteer. Samsung has been a leader in the Africa effort. Safaricom invented mobile banking uh, in East Africa that's known worldwide now. They chair a 10 corporate group uh, effort in the slums of Nairobi, transforming slum waste, they call it cash for tra uh, trash for cash, or recycling slum waste into youth enterprises that are owned. So these kind of innovative models are all part of a mosaic that some have called a global Peace Corps approach uh, with multilateral partners. I want to thank President Kim and Koika for helping lead this way, encourage your further role, as you mentioned today, in the Asia Alliance, and I know you're involved in upcoming convenings in Nepal, and also Peace Corps, including Peter Redmond that's here, Global Operations, Ted Abrams has given a charge to work on these projects. We'd be remiss in not naming at least two volunteers in the room. Chuck Hobi, uh, if you could stand, a former Peace Corps volunteer in Korea, uh, let's say two generations, and Unsun Kim, a Korean-American, just returned from Africa, rural villages in Ethiopia, President Kim, where she did joint projects with Koika. Uh, the, both of you stand, yeah, on uh, uh, health. Yeah, and Nancy Kelly uh, from Peace Corps uh, Korea uh, alumni. So all of them are part of this mosaic. And, uh, just last, I want to mention, along with these alliances, the role of broker nations like Mongolia was our last forum we had with CSIS in December. President Park and A has proposed a Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative. And the role of neutral nations like Mongolia and partners like Koika Peace Corps, UNSCAP, can be very significant in this mix. Uh, in 2011, GPF convened in the government house in Ulaanbaatar, uh, a convening looking at this whole role of convening youth and service and track two approaches in Northeast Asia. So like President Park's Northeast Asia Initiative, Mongolia President Elbigdorj has advanced the Ulaanbaatar Dialogue that's a regional approach to development that has profound implications for peace and security. Uh, Mongolia has a track record of hosting humanitarian, 
civil society as well as academic exchanges. So we think that's a place where Quaker Peace Corps and NGOs might find a next act, if you will, as a staging ground for collaborative projects of volunteers. And I'll leave you with, uh, including in June, uh, we'll co-convene in Ulaanbaatar Young Leaders Assembly in conjunction with an International Young Leaders Assembly at the UN and World Bank with Ban Ki-moon's Youth Envoy uh, that will then feed into the convening in Northeast Asia in Ulaanbaatar. Details on that at www.iwla.info. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you, John. Uh -huh. such an uplifting discussion. You know, usually we're talking about North Korean nuclear weapons. It's not very, <laughs> very uplifting. So this, is, this is fantastic. Um, so I'd like to offer a chance for the, uh, the audience to be involved in the discussion. If you could just raise your hand and, and um, uh, state your name and please ask a question. Uh, don't give a long, a long speech or anything like that. Um, personally, I'd also like to hear more from the ambassador. You had that picture up there of the of the MOU that was signed between the United States and the ROK on um, uh, involving Peace Corps and COICA. We'd love to hear more uh, from Peter and from Ambassador Kim about the things that you have that you're thinking about going forward. That would be actually quite, I think, quite interesting to the group. Um, but if you have any questions, just raise your hand and we'll begin the discussion. So. Hi, uh, Raylan Campbell with the United Nations Foundation. Um, and since nobody else was jumping up, I figured I'd touch on something that all of you alluded to, and that's the role of ICT um, and technology and innovation in new approaches. And just looking at the new global village movement, um, what kind of role does technology play in some of the partnerships that um, different organizations are, are pulling together. Um, I saw the cook stoves announcement uh, picture featured there, and that's, I know, part of the, the new village movement that COICA is rolling out. But just looking at um, different organizations and different approaches um, and how they're adopting technology and innovation into that. Thanks, Raymond. Yes, thank you for this, uh, this question. Um, I think we, we need to promote um, as many technologies as possible in rural development for many reasons. First one is the technology is giving them the opportunity to learn new method for agriculture and increase productivity. And morally, they, they, they have equal access to the modern world, civilization. And they need to improve their uh, environment, like uh, sanitation and health, and also uh, clean air in the house. Uh, for example, one cookstop device, which will completely reduce the um, pollution in the in the house by using, you know, dirty fuels and then uh, having no way of controlling the folks. That is in, that is the main culprit for uh, pneumonia and then. Uh, deaths of our young children, babies in the house. So, for example, we, we, if we can uh, teach them how to make a smart, small device to control the, the air is one way we can do. Uh, other thing is that, uh, you know, for example, if we help the farmers how to cultivate, we, they need to know how to use modern, small, not advanced, but modern technologies to restore, uh, store the products, mm -hmm. how to control products, how uh, to make it clean, how to prevent uh, being rotten, and also be connected with the uh, uh, internet so that they, they learn about to compare the price and how the marketizing is possible. There are so many ways for us to teach them introducing small technologies. One way for them to promote and get equal access to education is to use mobile and e-learning, distant learning. Other, other thing would be also using mobile networks and also other uh, equipments so that they can be connected with the health control and we can monitor what is the situation and what kind of emergencies they, they are facing so that the remote villages can be connected with some centers. So there are so many things to do with all these technologies 
we, we, we try to open our doors so that many geniuses are coming with their own devices and technology. Thank you. Peter. Thank you very much, President Kim and, um, and distinguished panel. Um, actually, the ICT question is, is perfect uh, segue into the question I had. Um, learning more about the new village model that was, was central to the 1970s development in, in uh, the Republic of Korea. I'm wondering, uh, that's sort of the a model that Peace Corps has been embracing over the years, of grassroots, sustainable development, rural focused. Um, times have changed though, I certainly ICT has had a big impact. Where do you see uh, other opportunities for development besides that new, the new village, that new village model approach? And that's Peter Redman, who's senior advisor for global operations at Peace Corps. You know, uh, things are interlinked. If we talk about the smart semaur, you know, that is a modern type of village movement, but there includes uh, woman empowerment and respect for children and consciousness for human rights and accountability, self-ownership. There are so many other values which are needed for modernization. But if we can separate and promote another brand, then Semar New Semar Village is, is uh, a technology-supported innovation or uh, connecting with the social value chain and global value chain. For example, by using ICTs or biotechnologies, a lot of products on the ground can be eco-friendly eco or more efficient, more productive, and more qualified. We would like to connect with the companies like uh, CJ in Korea. CJ is a, a group which produces food and trade food and running restaurants. They, if they are put in some villages and they teach them how to make uh, qualified products, we would ask them to buy. Then this remote village is being connected at the, at the point to global value chain because they are now in the market. N many, many small farmers around the globe living on the extreme poverty has never seen being connected with the market. Their products were remaining in the field and rotten and not used. When somebody has come and give small money and they take everything, they have no other way to resist. So we would like to help them with the technology and knowledge to be marketized, to be connected with the rest of the world. This will be, I hope, will be another brand for Koika uh, as one sustainable, um, creating impact, uh, creating impact for the um, global value chain. That would be another approach for us. Can I jump in on that? Yeah, John, quick? please. Um, I think President Kim is exactly right. We have a program called P4P, Purchase for Progress, that is very similar in concept. The idea is to take a, the whole community, the whole agricultural community in a village or what have you, and help them gain the technological understanding that they need, whether it's on the production side or, as he critically mentions, in the loss prevention areas. Um, and then give them access to markets, which is just a huge issue in, in <coughs> rural agriculture. Uh, they don't understand how to access the markets. They don't have access to credit. Um, but then when you give them a cell phone, and many have leaped beyond landlines, of course, they skipped the whole generation of technology, now they're into cell phones. And you can transfer money, you can transfer information, you can send market prices. And this, this, just this work can strengthen the amount of resources that a community can generate without increasing their production necessarily. It, you, you just reduce their losses, and it's still a profit for them. So these types of integrated approaches, as the president said, are exactly what needs to be done. It's no longer linear. It's an integrated action to ensure all aspects of the development process are addressed. 
thank you for supporting me. <laughs> David, I'm glad that our UN colleague mentioned the Women's Cookstove Project and, and President Kim, that you've, you've highlighted technology along with Peace Corps. When you look at the combination of small technology with larger technology like Safaricom's mobile banking platform in, in Africa, uh, I think the, the potential to redress any human challenge, whether conflict or develop, is really limitless. Uh, just to give you one anecdote, in Uganda villages, there are a thousand village health workers, mostly women, working, stringing up bed nets, uh, dealing with clean water source, and then they've added the cook stove project, uh, which our foundation also supported. And there were a couple of Peace Corps volunteers helping unlock that combination of medical doctors, you know, small technology, and, and it's one of the few evidence-based Macquarie University. They have actually an experimental evaluation design, uh, cookstoveproject.org, by the way. They're, they're here tomorrow night. But uh, I think that's a fascinating example. And Tim Shriver, uh, in his wisdom, his father created Peace Corps, uh, and John F. Kennedy, his, fa his father is Kennedy's uh, uh, brother-in-law, Sarge. Uh, who we all affectionately love here uh, that appreciate global service. Tim Shriver hosted in his home an event with uh, the other co-founder of Peace Corps, Harris Wofford, an event to promote these alliances in Africa. And Tim said, called all of this an open source platform. And uh, when you see these combinations of people coming together and perhaps in the 2015 post agenda collectively, as you've highlighted, President Kim, in your speech, uh, collective impact can zero in, like these Uganda Village projects, on, on many more examples uh, to turn the tide and to see a lot of tipping points in development and peace. Terrific, thanks. Uh, yes. My name is uh, Tong Kim. I just returned to Washington for good after having lived in South Korea for seven years. Uh, my question regards to the allocation of your resources as a donor country to other countries. And uh, it's not clear nowadays whether the South Korean government regards North Korea as part of their internal uh, relationship or to a special nature or on international, uh, by the international as a uh, normal state uh, one of the members of the uh, United Nations. So I don't think the assistance to humanitarian assistance to North Korea would fall under the scope of your activity as uh, your organization. But nevertheless, you did mention South Korea spends and uh, supports uh, hundreds of uh, millions of dollars to help other developing countries to improve their, their whatever need they may have a medical and environmental and economic development and so forth now. Uh, nevertheless, you did mention you work with the other UN organizations such as uh, UNDP and uh, other or WFP and so forth. My question is whether you can tell us that how much of your allocation of resources are geared, not directly as I said for the reasons I mentioned, but indirectly to North Korea to benefit, to the benefit of the North poor, poverty stricken North Koreans. Uh, this is one question. And of course, President Park's uh, trust building policy uh, stipulates that uh, there would be no restriction to provision of uh, humanitarian assistance to North Koreans, but that has not been happening as you know. Uh, so. Uh, let me just uh, give you one more comment. When I uh, was frequently visiting Pyongyang in the 1990s, in 1990s uh, UNDP was interested in helping North Koreans to develop it and improve their agricultural management and know-how. They, the North Koreans, were not interested in this type of innovation or agricultural management. They rather wanted to get uh, substantive uh, the assistance either in the form of uh, food assistance and anything more material assistance, that's what they were interested in. Uh, I don't know how UNDP is still working. I know they're still working in Pyongyang, but my question again, coming back to your activities, how much of your allocation of resources are geared for North Korea? Yeah. 
Uh, there are many uh, aspects in your question, Dr. Kim. Uh, first of all, uh, Korean government, not COICA, has been carrying out humanitarian, uh, uh, humanitarian assistance to North Korea steadily, not even, uh, not, if not uh, in very much ex expanded and um, changing way, but very steady. Uh, I think uh, accumulation of uh, in humanitarian assistance in North Korea by South Korea uh, reaches 3.8 billion by the end of last year. Uh, international donations to North Korea has uh, gone up during the late 90s and the early 2000s, but because of North Korean behavior, like uh, scaring others by sending firing missiles and then uh, nuclear tests and all the noise they are making uh, may have been contributed to the diminished international donations to uh, North Korea. Uh, humanitarian, total amount of humanitarian aid has been, has been diminished very quickly over the last uh, five to six years after North Korea went into nuclear bomb test. Um, European Union and some other Euro uh, individual European countries are, mini are carrying out uh, small uh, programs for food and uh, medical aid to North Korea. OCHA is uh, organizing all different type of uh, assistance to North Korea. Uh, Korea still even Korea is not fantastically, dramatically <coughs> increased, that doesn't increase the aid, but still Korea is the largest donor. Korea's position is very uh, com complicated and subtle in this uh, regard because by Korea's law, North Korea is still part of uh, Republic Korea. It's not foreign state. So when we trade with North Korea economically, North Korea is uh, considered a special, um, enjoying special status. Neither a foreign state nor, nor a part of Korea. It, we, we call it special relations. But if we go to United Nations, North Korea, we have accepted North Korea as another member of a member state of United Nations. So we deal with North Korea as a foreign state. So there is double, I, I must confess that there are double, double standards. Uh, our programs to our in, uh, humanitarian assistance to North Koreans is being used by internal unification fund, not mainly by our foreign, foreign, foreign assistance fund. But uh, Korean government used um, WHO, uh, UNFPA, and UNDP as an agent who is carrying out the assistance to North Korea. Uh, I think uh, hundreds of some level of uh, two, 20 million, I, I don't have the exact number, uh, are being used for helping those, those organizations. Some are being used for directly for North Korea, some are not used for North Korea. So we don't know exactly how much are being used for North Korea. But internal relations, we have been supporting some selected NGOs to go in North Korea to carry out uh, helping them to heal uh, tuberculosis and other activities, uh, giving them know-how how to make a noodle and then increase the productivity. These are being continued. While uh, we are not being asked, we, COICA, as an organization, we can do it or we, we don't have to do it depending on government policy, but we have not yet requested to, uh, to directly support aid to North Korea. But we are having excellent relationship with other UN organizations. We don't intervene in what uh, programs they are, uh, they are uh, using. Um, we're, um, we're running out of time here, but if I could ask you just one other uh, quick question. I, I was curious, do, how much work does COICA do with JICA? or other organizations like COICA um, in the region of Asia? Uh, 
We have regular meetings and then uh, regular contacts. Always we, we work with the JICA exchange programs and information. We have been trying to forge out a very specific joint programs in Cambodia and some other. We are very close, but we have not yet agreed on specific programs, but we are very close to do division of labor in promoting democratic and then managing electric system in Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan is one uh, good example of uh, how Koika is helping other countries for uh, being moving toward democracy. We are helping them with uh, equipment, new technology at the same time, the institution. JICA will be part, will take part of this big scheme and Swiss, Swiss will take another part. So I think finally we will be one in promoting uh, electoral system of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, but in, in Cambodia, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka, there are many uh, potential to cooperate each other. We are also take, uh, talking with uh, uh, Agence France, the, the developer AFD, uh, in, uh, for cooperation in Laos, mm -hmm. Cambodia, and Sri Lanka. And also, we are now making some detailed uh, uh, study on, on programs in Palestine with the Turkey, for example, and with Mexico, we are talking about how to help each other for helping Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many other uh, examples. So, thank you. Yes. Well, you know, Ambassador Kim, we always talk about how the USROK Alliance um, has grown and aspires to be and continues to be a global alliance. You know. Um, uh, as a public good providing to the international community. And I can't think of a better example of that in the alliance relationship than the work you're doing and the work COICA is doing, both with Peace Corps, USAID, uh, UN, as well as civil society. So thank you for all your work and thanks for taking the time today. Mm -hmm.